Okay, guys, we're going to be going on to the next section, the next set of notes, which is classical conditioning. And um, this one's going to be a little confusing because it has a lot of vocab that can be like, what? It's like the same words over and over again. So this is a good idea to always break down the words as I tell you guys to do, okay? So what is classical conditioning? That's your first subtopic. And classical conditioning is when you link a neutral stimulus, okay? Which a neutral stimulus, neutral, is it evokes no response. Like you do not, like it's nothing, okay? Like for example, this pen is just a pen. Nothing, if I show it to you, nothing's gonna happen. The word Zugu, like I did in class, that activity meant nothing to you before we did the activity. Those people that didn't do it, they're like, what is this name, Zugu, okay? Now, that was neutral before I started my story, okay? So neutral stimulus is when you, so then you link the neutral stimulus to another stimulus that will elicit, which will create a involuntary response. So involuntary, I want you to write, is all biological. It's those automatic responses, like kind of for survival, all right? Classical conditioning is all about the physical body, how and how we pair things together, right? Like this is, think of your fears, things that you're scared of, right? Like if you're scared of clowns, Clowns are, are neutral stimulus, not because not everybody is afraid of clowns, but everybody is um, afraid of like being scared, right? Like there's a response. If I scare you, you're going to respond. Usually they'll put the clown and getting scared together. You make that association and then it evokes a natural response. Okay. There's a process to this. Now, Stimulus response learning, okay, is the next little subtopic, is behaviors that can be learned through a stimulus and a response, okay? So stimulus response is if I touch a hot up a stove, I'm automatically going to remove my hands. So that's a stimulus response. I do something, you know, I touch something hot, my automatic response would be, to remove the hand. So this is kind of that process as what happens in classical conditioning, okay? It's like a stimulus and you respond. Now, the guy that started this whole thing, um, this whole thing about stimulus and response and all that stuff was Ivan Pavlov. And if you've heard um, about Pavlov's dog, this is it, okay? If you haven't, welcome to the show. I'll tell you a little bit about Mr. Pavlov, okay? He was actually a doctor. Well, was he a dog? I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. Anyway, so Ivan Pavlov was not a psychologist, okay, at all. He was literally a doc. He was researching the digestive system of dogs, okay? So he was looking to for digestion. So he noticed, right? So what they did is, and I'll show you a quick clip of um, in class about the dog. So what they did is they put this, um, like, whatever, a gadget here to measure the salivation, right? When they were gonna, when the dog was eating to, talk, to see the process of digestion. What ended up happening is that Pavlov noticed that the dog, all of a sudden, when they heard a bell or I'm, yeah, it was a bell because it had for the door, the dog would start automatically salivating. And he's like, why is the dog salivating if it's just, you know, I'm just entering the room. Um, and so he wanted to start figuring out why that was. So it turns out that he finds that the dog associated the bell with getting food because food automatically gives you a response of salivating, right? And so food, because your body knows how to, you know, that it's ready for to eat, but the dog made this association. It also made the association, like when they saw the person, right? The person with the lab coat, it made an association that the lab, that person is gonna give them food. And so you don't even need to have the food. They see the, the lab coat, start salivating, right? And this is, if you have any dogs, 
or any type of animals, they typically use classical conditioning to train the dogs, right? Or these animals. So you'll see that, let's say if you have a dog and your dog likes to go outside and all it needs to hear is the, the keys by the door, it automatically knows it's gonna go outside. And that elicits like an automatic response because they're excited to go outside. Or if you're gonna go to, you're gonna sit down at dinner, right? And maybe you just move the chair slightly the dog has and it, the dog comes running because it knows it's going to eat so that is you know the chair is a neutral stimulus it's just a chair but the dog has made an association that when that chair moves there's food and food gives me you know makes me hungry or whatever salivates okay so this is what he basically figured this out and this whole process to it so there's a lot of vocab and i need you to understand it we'll do a lot of practice because Trust me, we need a lot of practice, okay? It's confusing. So let's start with the neutral stimulus. A neutral stimulus is basically any type of stimulus that elicits no response. No response, it's neutral, okay? Before conditioning, all right? So I want you to write that down, neutral stimulus. So it's before conditioning, okay? So in this case, for Pavlov, you need to know Pavlov's, the example, and then I'm gonna give you Zugu's example. So the first example is for Pavlov's dog experiment when the bowl, the bowl of food had no initial response, right? Like just the bowl with no food, right? Just the bowl. Okay. So then you go on to the unconditioned stimulus. So this is a stimulus that naturally will trigger a response. Okay. Uh, let me go back to neutral stimulus real quick for the example for what we did in class. Zugu is a natural neutral stimulus. Okay. The second one, so the unconditioned, is basically anything that naturally or automatically triggers a response. Okay. So, an instance for unconditioned stimulus is the actual food because food for the dog automatically gives start salivating so to start digestion right in our case what we did in class was the lemonade powder which was sour so sour creates an automatic trigger of kind of salivation okay um so this is something and you need to write this down it is not learned it happens automatically this is biological Whatever this is, if you get hit, right, you're going to flinch. Okay. Now, the next one is the unconditioned uh, response. And I spelled that wrong here. Unconditioned uh, response is basically where you, you, it is the natural unlearned response. Okay. So for the dog experiment, it would be salivation. For our experiment is also salivation because of the sour. The only difference is here, they got food, we got sour stuff. Okay, and then we start the learning process in which once we condition, okay, and make, make that association, these things start happening, okay, where we're at here. So what ends up happening is the condition stimulus used to be, write this down, the neutral stimulus, okay? So, and the next bullet. So this after association, the unconditioned stimulus triggers the conditioned response, okay? So we link this association with whatever the neutral stimulus was, to the unconditioned stimulus, okay, this one here, and then we make that association, and then we get an automatic response, which becomes the conditioned response, okay? So the conditioned stimulus in the dog experiment would be just the bowl of food, like just the bowl without the food, and then that will create a conditioned response, which is salivation. 
these two are always typically the same, okay? And so in our case, with the experiment with Zugu, you should, when you heard it, your mouth should have salivated just a little bit if done correctly, okay? So for us, now all we need to hear is Zugu, and then our mouths will um, start salivating, okay? Here are some terms in classical conditioning that you need to know, okay? The first one is acquisition. Acquisition is literally the, like how we acquire, okay, the, the learning or the behavior. So this is the initial stage of when we link a neutral stimulus, Zugu, to an unconditioned stimulus, which is the, the lemonade, so that the neutral stimulus begins to trigger the conditioned response, okay? So what we did in class of me telling the story and saying Zugu over and over again, that was acquisition, okay? It's the process of making that association, okay? Um, now, you'll see that in the operant conditioning, the other type of behavior will also, there is an acquisition process. It's just a little different, okay? Um, it's more with like rewards and punishment. All right, now, everybody got that, the, it's the initial learning between the unconditioned stimulus, which is the neutral stimulus, and the um, conditioned stimulus, okay? To allow for them to have a conditioned response. All right. Now, there is this word called habituation, and you guys have seen this. And habituation is kind of like a habit, right? Very similar to that in which you are going to decrease your response to a stimulus with repeated exposure to it, which just basically means, it sounds odd, but it just basically means it becomes automatic. You're not even thinking about it, okay? That's habituation, all right? So like brushing your teeth, right? We brush our teeth, we learned it, and then we don't like think about it. It just becomes kind of like a habit. Now, there is what's called higher order conditioning. Higher order conditioning is like a second type of conditioning, like a second type of association. So it's not like for Zugu um, story, like it was just Zugu. That is just one thing you've associated. But if I would have put Zugu, well, now there's actually a higher order there is because now Zugu coming from Miss Lombana's voice is going to activate that. It's kind of like you've also made that association with something else. It's like a second association that was there without realizing it, okay? So for instance, for the one of the Pavlov's dog, it was not just the bull, but it was also the white coat, right? So it became like the person also is like the second um, conditioned person, all right? Now, there is what's called extinction, right? Like, so everything doesn't just stay naturally. So extinction is basically when you gradually weaken and eventually disappear the conditioned response, okay, to the conditioned stimulus. Just write it down, okay, because I know it's like conditioned, unconditioned, okay. Now, what essentially happens, extension is, if there is no pairing, like if you don't keep on practicing it, pairing of the neutral stimulus, which became the conditioned stimulus, to the condition, the unconditioned stimulus, there will be no response. So for example, if, you know, right now, Zugu's story is fresh. However, in a year from now, two years from now, if you don't hear it again, right, you're gonna hear it, you might remember the story, but your body may not physically respond. You won't have a response to it, okay? Um, 
if let's say the dog like the dog right if i keep on putting the bowl of food and there's no food in it eventually the dog is gonna learn like like it's gonna break that association it's kind of breaking the association is a good way to put that okay so basically the neutral stimulus and write this down does not produce a conditioned response anymore okay now spontaneous recovery spontaneous recovery this is key in which extinction must happen first in order for this to be spontaneous recovery okay so extinction must happen and then all of a sudden if you see the stimulus the neutral stimulus again it may invoke a response okay an automatic response that is spontaneous recovery however extinction must have happened first so for instance let's say in a year from now you hear the word zugu 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 and nothing right no response and then all of a sudden you hear it again randomly a couple of days later a year later and your mouth salivates that is spontaneous recovery okay um and typically this happens like you're not exposed to that association anymore now the next one is general generalization generalization is when uh once the response has been conditioned we tend to um associate similar stimuli to the conditioned um wait <laughs> to the conditioned stimulus so that it gives you the response okay and I'll tell you guys a, a story of Ms. Lombana. And so when I was a kid about generalization, it's basically, let me rewind before I tell the story. It's basically when you, uh, generalization is that you make an association with other things that are similar. So for me, it was dogs, right? I kind of um, got, not, I wouldn't say attacked. <laughs> he was running after me, this Doberman. Okay, I'll just say the story real quick. This Doberman got loose in our neighborhood and we were all playing outside, the kids, and the dog started chasing us, but it was a ginormous dog. And I freaked out and I was like, oh my God. And I run, but I fell. And so when I fall like back, the dog got on top, like, you know, and I was like, oh my God, my life is over. And now hindsight, I look and the dog just wanted to play because it was literally like, ah, you know, it didn't attack me or anything but I freaked out. And from that moment, right, I made an association of that dog, the, I associated it with fear, okay? Like terrified, I was scared. Um, so after that, I generalized that all dogs, right? It didn't matter if it was big or small, I was terrified of dogs, okay? Now, discrimination, is when you learn the ability to distinguish between a, the conditioned stimulus, right? For me, it would be like the big dog and, um, and other stimulus that do not signal the unconditioned, wait, ah! <laughs> okay, I have my, I'm reading my notes, but I'm like, wait, this doesn't make sense. So it's basically you're able to distinguish between the the condition stimulus, which is the neutral, and um, the unconditioned stimulus, so that it doesn't give you a response. So basically, you're discriminating, and it's more specific. Like so, then for me, what ended up happening as I got older, my brother I was still terrified of dogs uh, for a long time. Um, and then it didn't get extinct, my, that behavior, because as I, in my teens, I saw these two dogs, a Doberman and a Rottweiler fighting. Cause one of my friends had those two dogs and they were always fighting. And it was so traumatic that I was like, oh my God, these dogs are super deadly. So it reinforced my behavior, right? My fear. Now discrimination happens when my brother, he got a bigger dog. He got, a, um, a husky, super cute, best dog ever. And I fell in love because the dog was adorable. So cute. And so that allowed me, right, to start 
discriminating against like all dogs instead of all dogs it became just still have a fear of like dobermans and rottweilers right it becomes a little bit more specific um little dogs also don't scare me anymore so that becomes the discrimination okay it's distinct it's like specific to something okay now what you need to know is the little Albert experiment. And this is where John Watson was like, hey, let's try this whole thing about Pavlov with humans. Um, just to let you know, this is unethical and you'll see why. But this was way before, way back when, <laughs> uh, before any ethics. So John Watson was like, hmm, let's try it on humans. Okay, so he got this little boy, this a little baby, and I'll show you a video of it in class. and. He basically wanted to see, can I have, can I make the baby afraid of something? Okay. So basically what he did, he wanted to um, have him get scared of a rat. Okay. So the first thing he did is he needed to see if the rat was a neutral stimulus. And sure enough, the rat was a neutral stimulus. The baby was like, oh, I want to play with it, blah, blah, blah. So, okay. Neutral. Nothing happens. Now. In the process of the acquisition, the process of learning, the association, what this guy did, Watson did, was that he started bringing the rat out, and every time the rat came out, he would hit a like a one of those gong things, like those, you know, ding, whatever. So the baby would get scared because loud noises creates a, a scare, right? Like it activates your kind of fight or flight um so every time he would hit that drum thing with the hammer then the child would you know get scared so he kept on doing that he'd take out the rat hit the the drum thing and then the child would get scared so the child the baby associated the rat with getting scared and so soon enough little albert um associated what he did he generalized that that association with not just a rat but anything that was like fluffy he was terrified of santa claus like it was you know a bunch of stuff that he associated with um like generalized with the stimulus okay um and so it didn't discriminate obviously this is very unethical because you cannot um, have a research that makes a person worse, right? Now, he could do what he could have done to fix it is uh, create an uncondition the baby to to not be scared of the rat. For the most part, people do not use research, um, do any type of research to create a like a fear to then try to take it away, okay? Because fears, as you guys know, is not so easy to get rid of, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that, all right? That's it, guys. Thank you.